Well, good morning and welcome once again to our morning service on YouTube. It's great to be able to still share this with you, send this out at the weekend while we're meeting together for those who can't join us. Now, as we open our service, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your continuing mercies, Lord, to allow us to meet together. We thank you that we can still upload videos of your word, Lord. We thank you that we can still spend time hearing your, your name praised, Lord, in song. We can still see the kids talk, still hear the Bible readings and pray together, Lord. We pray now as we head into this service that you would be with us, that you would guide us, Lord. Amen. Well, this week just gone has been our first week back to normal in some ways. On Sunday last week, we met together for our two services. During the weekdays, we had our Bible at bedtime that Liz has been leading. On Monday night, there was a, a Pebbles video, a uh, Pick a Mix video, sorry, that went up. And on Tuesday, we had both the Pebbles video in the morning, but also we had pebbles at the park, at Cornus Park. On Wednesday night we were able to meet together to begin our series in Romans on Zoom Bible studies and then on Friday we met with our young people. So to be thinking of all these events, all these things and outreach that we're doing during the week and all of those things will be happening again this week. If you want any more information about any of them, find out what time they're starting, how to access them, where we are going to be, please do get in touch. We'll read the weekly email and we'll make sure that you know exactly where you need to be. Well, soon we're going to be looking together at the start of chapter 23 of Acts as we reach the final part of our journey of Paul as he heads on to the end of Acts. But before we come together to look at that, we're going to spend some time hearing some song sung for us, seeing a children's talk. I'm going to spend some time praying and hearing from the Bible. So I'm going to pass over to the team now who, who will lead us through those different sections. J. 
just letters on pages It's life and it's love and it's freedom for us Your word is more than just wisdom of ages This treasure's our Well, good morning, children. It's good to be able to continue to, to tell you children's talks while we're not with each other. It's good that we can still meet together, isn't it? And we can still spend time looking at our book, Everything a Child Should Know About God. And we've been learning all sorts of things, haven't we? We've been learning about the Garden of Eden. We've been learning about who God is, what he's done. And more recently, we've been thinking about how Jesus came to help us. And over the last few weeks, we tried to get to know who Jesus was, what he came to do, and why he came to do it. And, and last week, David led us as he told us that Jesus left his home in heaven to come to be with us. And that's an amazing thing. And the great thing is that when Jesus left his home in heaven, he came to be like us, to be a human like us, to be fully God and fully man. Now, Jesus didn't come and, and walk immediately as a man. Now, Jesus came in a different way, in the same way that me and you came into this world. Now, over the last few weeks, me and Ali have had to go to the hospital to see doctors. And some people know, and some of you will know as well, that we are expecting another baby. And what we were able to do, we were able to see our baby. The one that will come in the middle of January. And that's a great thing. And when that baby comes, it will be a baby, won't it? Just like you were. Just like I was. And you know what? Just like Jesus was. Because when Jesus came, he came as a baby. And we, we read about that all at Christmas, don't we? Now our book tells us that Jesus left his wonderful home in heaven. He came down to earth to help us. Did he come as an angel? No. He came as a baby. Did he come as a mighty king? No. But as a baby. Would you be afraid of a baby? Of course not. Look at our picture today. It shows us a little baby. Jesus, when he came to earth, came as a baby. And so he knows what it's like to grow up. He knows what it's like to be you and me. But he was perfect. Now our question today is, did Jesus come to earth as a powerful king. Did he? No. He came as a baby. Well, thank you for listening so well this morning. I hope to see you again next week. 
as we continue through our book and somebody else reads to us from the next part of our story of Jesus so we can get to know him even more. Well, let's just pray as we finish. Dear Lord, we thank you that you came down from heaven to save us. You gave up your time in glory to come and to be a baby, to grow on this earth and to be like us in human form, Lord. Oh, we thank you that you are perfect and that you did amazing things for us that we'll read about in the coming weeks, Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, let's spend some time singing together now, shall we? Okay. God doesn't have a birthday, no moment he was made. For he is the beginning, he made both time and space. But when I think about it, I simply cannot see how God's always been there, living eternally. Our God is higher than the Don't understand how Jesus can be God, living life as a man. Our God is higher than the heights above. also find mysteries he is infinite and i'm just a limited me such deep thinking about the god we know shows he's not just more than us he's in a league of his own Let's spend some time in prayer. Let's pray together. 
Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come to you in prayer. We thank you that you've made this provision for us, Lord, in your grace and in your mercy. That we can come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, whom you've appointed as our great high priest, the one who goes between us and you, the Holy One, and we who are sinful. We thank you that by your grace, through him, you've cleansed us from your sin, and we can come to you now, even though we are still sinful, Lord. Uh, even though we still disobey you at times, Lord, we, we thank you that you've cleansed us. We thank you that you've bought us with a great price, the price of the very blood of the Lord Jesus Christ shed on the cross for us. So we thank you, Lord, that we can come to you now in his name. And we ask you that you be with us on this your day, we pray, especially as your word is preached, Lord, that you open our hearts to your word, that you'd Help us to listen, help us to learn, help us to grow by your word, we pray. And by your spirit working in us and through us. Lord, strengthen us, we pray, so that we might have that desire to serve you as we ought to. And live for you as we should. Please help us, we pray, because we are prone to wonder, Lord. We're prone to disobey you, because our flesh can drag us down. But we thank you, Lord, that you, by your power, are able to overcome uh, the power of the flesh, Lord, the power of the sin that still lies within us. We, we thank you, Lord, that the one who has saved us is greater than all things, Lord. He's greater than the world. He's greater than our flesh, and he's able to help us. And so, Lord, we, we thank you for all these things. Lord, we pray for those who as yet, who, whom we know, Lord, that uh, have not yet trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. We do pray for them. Uh, we pray for our family members, Lord, who don't know you. We pray for our neighbours who don't know you, Lord, for our work colleagues. and Just friends that we're aware of, Lord, who as yet have not trusted the Lord Jesus. We pray for those opportunities, Lord, to, to share our faith with them, Lord, and that you make us ready to have an answer for the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus. Please help us to be clear. And help us to be true in our testimony, we pray. And Lord, we pray that you would even use us to extend your kingdom. And despite the restrictions that we have upon meeting and all the problems associated with the coronavirus pandemic, we pray that you would help us nevertheless to reach out and to be effective witnesses for you as your people. So Lord, we do pray about this pandemic. We do pray that you would have mercy on us as a, as a nation, Lord, and as a world, Lord, that, oh, Lord, that you would bring this to an end, Lord, by your grace, whether by, indeed, by miraculous means or or by your providence in providing a, a vaccine, Lord, and leading a specialist to, to a solution. We pray that you would do that and have mercy upon us, Lord, and that this thing will, will be clear and we'll be able to carry on uh, to some extent, Lord, as we used to. We just commit that to you. Thank you that we can pray about these things, knowing that you are in control, knowing that all these things are in your hands and in your providence, O oh Lord. We pray especially for any who we know that are going through a difficult time, Lord, whether caused by issues concerned with the pandemic or other things that are, are causing problems, Lord. We, we do pray that you'd be with your people, that you would uphold them, Lord, and give them all needed grace and strength to go on with you. And we do think of the wider church, Lord, and we do think of the church worldwide, and, uh, and so many, uh, in so many places, Lord, there's persecution, there's pressure on your people. We pray that you deliver them and help them, O oh Lord. So we commit to into your hands the, the leadership of our country, Lord, and of Wales and of Britain at large, and we pray that you would give wisdom in the, in the decisions that are being made, in the measures that are being proposed. Lord, we, we do pray that you would guide and that our leaders might acknowledge their need of coming to you for grace and help. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd hear our prayers now and forgive us for our many sins. We thank you that there is forgiveness with you in the Lord Jesus Christ, that you may be feared, that you may be worshipped. 
us. And Lord, we ask all these things in and through his precious name. Amen. This morning's reading is from Acts chapter 23, verses 1 to 11. Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. At this, High Priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. Those who were standing near Paul said, How dare you insult God's high priest? Paul replied, Brothers, I did not realise that he was the high priest. For it is written, Do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and others Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, My brothers, I am a Pharisee, descended from Pharisees. I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was div divided. The Sadducees say there is no resurrection, and that there are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees believe all these things. There was a great uproar, and some of the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, stood up and argued vigorously. We find nothing wrong with this man, they said. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage, as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. Well, thank you for that. Well, we're going to be looking now at those words from Acts 23, verses 1 through to 11. And we're going to be thinking about the idea that God works. But before we do that, let's just pray together. And then we'll spend a short time looking at these words together. Father, we pray now as we come around your word that you would be speaking through it, Lord. That you would uphold me. That you would be with all the words that, that flow. Father, we pray that you would bless this time. That you would speak through your word into our hearts now. That we would be challenged in, in how we acknowledge your work and how we trust in you, Lord. Amen. Amen. We'll do keep those words open in front of you as we spend time looking at them together. God works in amazing ways. Throughout the book of Acts, we've already been able to see different ways in which God works. We've seen him working through the disciples as they were filled with the, the Spirit at the start of this book. As they were sent out to speak in tongues into Jerusalem. As they reached out to people who, who had never heard them speaking that way before. We've seen the way in which Philip was used. As he walked along the road and met the Ethiopian eunuch. We've seen the way that the gospel was shared and spread. And we've seen the way that churches have been planted by Paul and others. And how God has been working out, not just in the Jewish world, but out into the Gentile world as well. Rick Warren wrote, you were made for a mission. God is at work in the world and he wants you to join him. The assignment is called your mission and is both shared and specific. One part of it is a responsibility you share with every other Christian, and the other part is an assignment uniquely for you. God will work in many different ways, and as we examine this passage this morning, we're going to see the way in which we are called into that work, and the way that that work is there to teach us, how it will help us understand how we can overcome different things and how we can be challenged and convicted by the Lord in our lives. Paul has been placed before the Sanhedrin here this morning by the Roman centurions in light of the information that we saw about Paul last time. He's been given a second chance to speak of Christ, to share the good news with these Jews. 
We've seen that he's been given a chance once again to speak about how he has reached out to the Gentiles, not on his own accord, but because the Lord willed it. And firstly, as we look at God working, well, we see that God works even when we're wrong in verses 1 through to 5. How God works even when we're wrong. God works even when we find ourselves doing things that are not what he wants. That isn't because we deserve him to work, but because God has a plan, and us in our small human ways can't change God's plans. Back in Eden, when Adam and Eve ate from the tree, God continued his work. He sent them out, he cursed the serpent, but still he had work in the world, and it continued on, the work of sending his son. When David coveted Bathsheba and ended up murdering Uriah in time, God would work. He'd bring Solomon into the world. He would use him for many good things for his kingdom. Even when Peter rejected even knowing Jesus three times around the campfire, God was at work. He was preparing the man for the forgiveness that he would receive later from Christ and the work that would then be done after the Lord had ascended on high. God works even when we're wrong. He'll correct us. He's ready to guide us in the right ways of living for he has a plan. Here we are going to see Paul's judgment be, be off, but we will still see God at work in the conversation, even when Paul is called to say sorry for his words and his actions. The previous day, Paul saw a great opportunity go unfulfilled, didn't he? If you remember last time, he was in front of the crowd and he couldn't get his words out before they blew up into that big anger and he had to be taken away by the Roman guards. The riot had started, and now Paul has a second opportunity to win Israel for Christ, and perhaps a better opportunity. Here, he spoke to the council. It was an opportunity to preach Jesus to these influential men. He looks straight up at them, and he begins to speak, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. As he spoke to them, he set himself alongside them. He calls them brothers. He wants them to understand that the thing he has done has been done because God has sent him. In these words that he has a clear conscience, Paul isn't saying that he's righteous in his own sense, in his own right, sorry. He's rather saying that these acts, these acts of going out to the Gentiles, of going to speak of Christ to them, have been done and nothing has been wrong with them. The crowd had been angered. They had flared up in response to those words in chapter 22, verse 21, when he said that he was sent to the Gentiles, but God had been behind these works. He had a clear conscience in going and eating in their houses, in meeting with them in public places. But still we see the anger, don't we? Paul's claim to a clear conscience seems to anger the high priest. He looks at this man, accused of all these crimes, trying to claim that he is innocent, and he is offended by it. He sends someone to strike him, and there's a lot going on here, because this striking of him, well, it was an illegal order, Hughes says, for the Jewish law said, he who strikes the cheek of one Israelite strikes it, uh, uh, strikes as if it were the glory of God. And he that strikes a man strikes the Holy One. This was against their own rules to strike someone who hadn't been found guilty. And Paul's response to this with his words, uh, well, we don't know the tone of it, do we? But we see truth coming out in it. God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. He calls him a whitewashed wall here. Whatever the tone, the rebuke was entirely accurate. It was in some ways justified. The man who commanded that a defenseless man be punched in the face indeed was a whitewashed wall, a white veneer of purity covering over obvious corruption. And Paul continues, you sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you violate it yourself. Now this is where we see a problem. 
Because this, this response of Paul, it seems to go against teachings from Matthew 5, verse 39, where Jesus said, But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, then turn to them the other cheek also. Paul was human. He seems to allow his frustrations to come across in these words, even if he's right with the things that he's saying, even if this high priest is a corrupt man making himself look good, he is called not to respond in this way. And so there is an issue here. Paul's words here are showing the hypocrisy on show from the high priest. In fact, it's a prophecy as well to the, to the high priest's fate. Longnecker says, Paul's words, however, were more prophetic than he realized. Ananias' final days, despite all his scheming and bribes, were lived as a hunted animal and ended at the hands of his own people. So this, this man, this high priest who, who makes himself look all holier than thou, is actually a man who has corruption and bribery behind the scenes, and later he will be hunted down by the Jews. Now, whether right or wrong, the words that he said, there was just no way to speak to the high priest, even if the high priest was, was sinful. And as soon as he finds out who this man was, we see, in a few moments, his, his sorrow. Bruce said he displays his ready submission to the law, which he was accused of flouting. I did not know he was the high priest, he said, meaning that had he known, he would not have called him whitewashed a wall. Since the law of Moses forbade an Israelite to revile a ruler of his temple in Exodus 22, verse 28. Paul instantaneously knew that he was in the wrong in his outburst. No matter how he said it, he agreed that it was wrong to speak evil of the ruler of his people. Yet Paul excused himself, claiming that he didn't know who this man was. Didn't know that the man who commanded the punch was the high priest. Maybe he wasn't looking. Maybe, maybe this was passed along. He said, I just didn't know. I apologize. He sees that he is wrong. But God is still at work, isn't he? Paul had been brought before these people so that he could tell them of all that was happening on his travels. And all that had happened with the crowd on the previous day. The Lord was showing that his people will submit to the law, even if the one enforcing it is not following it himself. And God will continue to use this conversation to build an understanding of these people and the, the continue to push his agenda with Paul's life. Paul had been wrong. He had spoken out of turn. He had spoken against one of the rulers, but his repentance, his apology, showed that he was not against God. Rather, he was for him. He was not someone teaching rejection of the law and the temple, but rather someone who worked for God while following the laws. There are times when we go wrong, when we sin, when we turn from, his, from the things that we should do. We must be like Paul. We must realize our sin and we must repent. We must come back to him. We must ask him to work in us in spite of our sinful hearts. We must ask him for his strength to help us walk for him. For God works in amazing ways. And as we continue, we see that he also works in verses 6 through to 9 to divide those against him. He works to divide those who are against him. Now, dividing those who oppose you has always been a very useful method of battle, hasn't it? The maxim, divide et imperia, has been attributed to Philip II of Macedonia. It was utilised by the Roman ruler, Julius Caesar, and the French emperor, Napoleon. Elements of this technique involve creating or encouraging division among the subjects to prevent alliances that could challenge the sovereign, aiding and promoting those who are willing to cooperate with the sovereign, fostering distrust and enmity between local rulers, encouraging meaningless expenditure that reduce the capability for political and military spending. Historically, this strategy was used in many different ways by empires seeking to expand their territory. 
The enemies of God are just as susceptible to these things as any enemy. And the reason that is is because they look to personal interests. And by doing this, they're never fully going to agree on the best way to go forward. They will all be looking out for their own interests, what's best for them. Paul knows the crowd that he is standing in front of. He knows that they are people who do not agree on everything. And so God draws him to use this to his advantage, to bring about ruin for those who are currently trying to attack God's messenger. See, Paul knows the crowd. He knows some are Sadducees and some are Pharisees who are there. These men had all come together thinking that they could oppose the outreach to the Gentiles on a level playing field. But Paul knew them well. He knew that their union was very fragile. Paul's Paul's course was to divide the Sanhedrin among the party lines, to get some on his side, the Pharisees, and, and have them sympathetic to them, to him, instead of having them united against him. He says, I am a Pharisee, descended from Pharisees. I stand trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. Knowing his audience, he refers to his heritage. He looks to the Pharisees and says, I am one of you. I was born as one of you. Concerning the hope of resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. He knew that this matter was a controversy between the two. And once again, he reminds them that he has things in common with them. Now, of course, this was essentially a true claim, what he was saying here. The centre of Paul's gospel was a resurrected Jesus. He was being persecuted because he believed that Christ had resurrected He was being judged over the matter of the resurrection of the dead. He was preaching that Jesus had risen and had gone to be with the Father. And so he points them to that truth that he believes. And when he says this, a dispute breaks out among the people. The Pharisees and the Sadducees oppose one another in these things. Suddenly the crowd who were united against Paul, well, they find themselves divided even moving towards his way of thinking, some of them. Paul picked the right issue here. Framed it in these terms, he immediately gained the Pharisees as allies. He let them argue it out with the Sadducees, no longer united against him. And and Luke goes on to give us an understanding of where the division comes. The Sadducees say there is no resurrection, and that there are no angels or spirits, but the Pharisees believe in these things. Usually, the Sadducees and the Pharisees were bitter enemies. We know that from other places. But but they were able to unite in opposition, not just here, but also against Christ in in Matthew 16 and John 11. And then Paul here. It's strange how people with nothing in common will come together as friends to oppose God or his work. But at this point, God brings about division between them. So they can no longer stand. This united force that had been there is is broken so easily. There was a great uproar. Some of the Pharisees stood up and argued vigorously. We find nothing wrong with this man. They look at Paul, the man they'd been accusing, and say, No, he's fine. What if a spirit or an angel has told him these things? What we see here is an argument erupt. We see the turning of the Pharisees away from the unity and back to the words from their teacher, Gamaliel, that are found in Acts 5, verse 38 and 39, when he said, Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone, let them go, for if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourself fighting against God. Gamaliel knew that if God was behind the words of the apostles back in Acts 5, then there was nothing that could stand in the way of it. And here it is the same. The group united against Paul and his teaching are divided because of a few words. Not because Paul had craftily convinced them to turn away from one another, but because the Lord was at work to divide those who stood against him. For Paul was doing God's work, 
Paul had been given these instructions from Christ. This was all of God. God had been at work here, changing all these events surrounding Paul. He had brought him from the attacks of the crowd to the division of those who stands against Christ. What an amazing work it was. These intellectuals are unable to stay united because God stands against them. God will often break the enemy with division. He will make them weak though their own ways of think- through their own ways of thinking. And they will feel strong. They will feel united until the Lord works in those small things and brings disunity among them. When we stand in the world now, we stand against a world that rejects God. But they don't all reject the same thing about him. Some call themselves agnostics, some atheists, others believe in some kind of spirituality but but can't believe in God. But they cannot agree with each other on all of these things. And we should pray that the Lord would give us the strength against these enemies. That he would show us how to walk for him against these people. Paul knows the great work that the Lord has in store for him. He takes confidence in that, and we must ask the Lord to bring us together, to unite us in him. It's easy for us to fall into disunity as well, to worry too much about the small things, to miss the key important things of the gospel. So we should ask God to bring us together, to unite us in his word, so that we will find our strength in him alone. And we know we can ask him for help. And as we close, as we look at verses 10 and 11 together now, well, we see that God works to protect his people. God works to protect his people. An article in National Geographic several years ago provided a great image of God's protection of his people. After a forest fire in Yellowstone National Park, forest rangers began their trek up a mountain to assess the inferno's damage. One ranger found a bird literally petrified in ash, perched statuesquely on the ground at the base of a tree. He didn't like seeing what he was looking at here, and he decided to knock the bird over with a stick to see if there was anything underneath. And and when he gently struck the bird, three small chicks scurried out from under their dead mother's wings. This loving mother, keenly aware of the impending disaster, had carried her offspring to the base of this tree, had gathered them under her wing, instinctively knowing that the toxic smoke would rise. She could have flown away. She could have been safe, but she would have had to abandon her chicks. And then the blaze arrived and the heat had scorched her small body. The mother had remained steadfast, protecting her children. She had been willing to die so that those under the cover of her wings would live. Psalm 91 verse 4 says, He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. God loves his people in this way. He showed that that as he sent his son down to die for them, but he also shows his love in other ways some of which we see in the protection that is on show in this passage and is promised going forward. The dispute becomes so violent here that the Romans have to get involved. They feel obliged to to protect Paul, so they pull him in. The commander had to be certain that these Jews were crazy in their endless and violent disputes. He had, he had watched as they went into an uproar at the word Gentiles. And now as he's watched once again, they've done the same thing over the word resurrection. The danger to Paul's life is clear and is real. The Roman centurions know that it is there. It's obvious to him at this point, and so the commander has to decide what to do next. So he orders the troops in. He says, go down, take him away from them by force, and bring him to the barracks to safety. Paul's ploy rescues him from the council. He could not have been happy with the result, though. He had the opportunity to preach to a huge crowd of attentive Jews on the Temple Mount, and it ended in failure with the riot. 
Then he had an opportunity to preach to the influential Jewish council, and it also ended in a fistfight. Later, Paul seemed to suggest that this tactic of bringing up the resurrection controversy in this way was not a good thing to do. He, he suggests that it was a wrongdoing on his part in Acts 24 verses 20 and 21 when he said, or these who are here should state what crime they found in me when I stood before the Sanhedrin, unless it was the one thing I shouted as I stood in their presence. It is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you today. Paul obviously saying that maybe, maybe that wasn't the right thing for him to say at that time. But God had been at work in this. He protected him here from the Sanhedrin. Not just from their judgment, but also from these riots as the Roman soldiers went down and brought him in. Paul was in real danger, yet the Romans saved him. But that's not the only thing we see from the Lord in this closing section of our passage today. For the following night, the Lord stands near Paul and speaks to him. What a difficult situation Paul was in. Rejected by Jews held by the Romans, his two opportunities to speak of Christ coming to, the, to nothing it would seem. But God still had worked for him, still wanted to make clear what was to come next, and so he goes to him. He offers protection for him. He shows it by, by coming to him at this point and speaking to him. Paul was alone, but he wasn't alone. If everyone else forsook him, Jesus was enough. Better to be in jail with the Lord than to be in heaven without him. Guzik says those words. God had shown his protection of Paul in prison multiple times in Acts and, and continues to do so now as he sits with these Romans. He speaks to him, take courage. As you've spoken about me in Jerusalem, so will you in Rome. We have to believe Paul was struggling. But God comes in. He brings courage to this man. You might think that things are bad right now in your life. But you may not even know the half of it. But Jesus does. Jesus knows and he still says to you, be of good cheer, take courage. Why? Not because everything's fine. But because God is still on his throne and he still holds to his promise and all things work together for the good of those who love God to those who are the called according to his purposes. Read Romans 8 verse 28 for those words. Paul shouldn't worry about his safety for God has plans for him. Paul will be safe under these plans. He's going to Rome. He will speak there. So at this point he is safe. The promise of more work to do was also a promise of continued protection here. Paul had to live until he had finished the work God had set for him. Bruce says the, the, uh, this assurance means much to Paul during the delays and the anxieties of the next two years and, and goes far to account for the calm and dignified bearing which from now on marks him out as a master of events rather than their victim. As we go through the next two years of his life, as he heads towards Rome, he always knows that he will go there. That the Lord will lead him there. And so he trusts in God for his protection. The work of God is something amazing in the life of Paul. He has been pushed here and there. He's been persecuted. He's been turned against by those he once considered friends. And now he is in the hands of the Romans. But God works. And Paul knows that. He knows that God works, even when he is wrong. He repents and he looks to the Lord for guidance. He knows that God works to bring his enemies to ruin. As he has watched them turn on one another. And he, in turn, has been backed by those who had rejected him. And now he also knows that God works in protection. As he has promised him that he will go to Rome. He will speak more of Christ. This is not the end for him. Paul knows that there is still more to his story. And no matter what he faces on his way there, he will head to Rome. We may not be given that same kind of assurance in our lives. We may not have the promise of a long life. 
We may not be shown the plans that God has for us, but what we do know is that because of the work of Jesus, our final destination as children of God is eternity with him. We need to take confidence in God's work while we live on this earth. When we make mistakes, we should come to him. We should ask him for forgiveness. We should ask that he work in all situations despite our own sinfulness. We should take confidence in his work when we are faced with our position. When we try and speak of his name and people turn against him, we should trust in him, knowing that God will work to frustrate those who are against him. And we should take confidence that God will protect us for the plans he has for us are set by him. And if those plans are short, then he will take us to be with him. But if those plans are long, we will go on with him as long as they are there. So take courage in the plans of God and know that God works. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you that you work, Lord. We thank you for these words of, of Acts, Lord, that show us your amazing work over all of this situation, Lord. And we pray that we would trust in you for this work. We pray that we would fix our eyes on you, that we wouldn't allow ourselves to be bogged down in worldly thinking, worldly living, but instead, Lord, we would, we would look to you for all we need. Father, we pray for forgiveness for the times that we do things wrong, and we pray that you would correct us in those things and call us back to you, so that we would live as you would want us to, Lord, we pray. Amen. Well, let's sing together now.
let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time we can share together around your word, Lord. And we pray that as we head out into the world this week, deep, that we would trust in you and your works, Lord. That we wouldn't worry about those who oppose us, but we would look to you, Lord. Father, we pray that you would bless us and keep us and bring us back to share in your word again. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us this morning. God bless. Thank <laughs> you.